What is the foundation that John expounds upon as he explains the good news of Jesus Christ? And what are the implications of that foundation, which is where John takes us after explaining that to us? To be more specific, and in particular, what did God in Jesus Christ come here to earth for? I like John's work. He expounds so well on Jesus, the Jesus that the disciples knew and others at the time knew. That is the Jesus they had known and had physically experienced his presence. John explains and demonstrates who this Jesus was and the message that he was intent on delivering to his follow followers. What it was that Jesus was on here on earth to do. I love that first verse of John's Gospel. I remember hearing it for the first time as a child when my dad was reading through the New Testament to us for our family Bible reading time after tea at night. Yeah, we called it tea, not dinner. Lots of Christian leaders and pastors used to urge us to begin the day with God and have a family devotion before we went to do our regular daily responsibilities. But that would have been difficult for us on the farm because our mornings involved milking cows, getting the cream to the cream carter, feeding the pigs and catching the, our horses to go to school. But anyway, I thought that John 1, 1 was a rather strange combination of words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yes, the Word was God, not a God as certain cults would have us believe. I'll say it again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I, when I first saw it, I thought, I wonder what on earth could that mean? But somewhere along the way, I did learn that the word, word, was a ref reference to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But not that he was any human bearing, being. It signifies his greater significance in coming to earth. He was not just another historical fig figure. There, this was no ordinary historical personage. And John wants us to realise it. He had a pre-existence. And do you know, I find a lot of Christians don't realise that. Some years ago when the church I was at, that some people were quite surprised. Uh, uh, did Jesus live before he came to earth? Well, truth is, and the scriptures makes it plain that he did. Now John is trying to expand upon truth, eternal truth, eternal reality that is behind everything in the message of the apostles. And John himself has been proclaiming since the Lord's ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit. That is, they have been praying, uh, pr proclaiming, the apostles, John included, the gospel and what's there. And John seeks to make it more plain and explain what it's all about. His words help us to understand why Jesus would come to earth. John wants us to understand the full context of the gospel teaching that he and the others want to convey. Let us turn aside for a moment and think about humans and the things that we think that sets us apart from the animal world. There have always been questions that have troubled human beings. Why are we here? Why is there something rather than nothing? Now, <laughs> that 
might sound a funny, funny question to ask, but if you think it about it, it's quite significant. Why is there actually something? Why isn't there nothing? Can we even conceive of what nothing actually is? <laughs> I don't know. And in this life, what are we meant to do? How are we meant to live? Is there life beyond this life? What would that life be like? These are questions that people have always asked and wondered about. People from various, these deep questions, people from various places around the world and in history have pondered these questions. Philosophers with nothing to do but read and write books. Stone Age people who had nothing to do but build massive stone structures such as Stonehenge, Machu Picchu and the ruins of Zimbabwe. They built these stone structures. And then there were tribal communities sitting around the campfire at night looking up at the stars. Their dying, dogs lying there with them to keep them warm and listening for movement in the dark. The king's wise men who we consulted on important matters. Einstein at age 16, he looked up in the starry skies one night and pondered it all. And even prisoners in concentration camps in the gulags contemplate these deep questions of meaning as do the Tuesday morning coffee guys from this church. Some philosophers in our modern world would have us believe that all there is to life and the universe is matter and the stuff that everything is made of. Atoms and molecules, that's all there is. That's nothing else. There is stuff. And then what happens and what has happened in all of the universe in history is a series of chemical reactions that bring us to where we are right now. That's right, we started off with some protoplasm and who knows how that came about. And with mutations and whatever else, I'm not a scientist, we wind up to what we are today. All life's intricacies, our feelings and emotions, all biology, all human history, all our inventions and achievements, nothing more than chemicals and physical laws interacting to make for you and me what we see and what we are today. Everything is predestined and we come up with existence as we have it today. In the words of the famous atheist of our time, Richard Dawkins, it's all in our DNA and we dance to its tune. But does anybody really live thinking like that? If we are just matter, then the consciousness we have is just an illusion. Does anybody really believe that? Does anybody believe that all our decisions were predetermined as molecules and cells and goodness knows what else, just came together in a certain way at a certain time? If that was the case, our thinking would be meaningless. The idea of a right and wrong would be meaningless. And life itself would be meaningless. So, as I said, nobody can live like that. We don't like being told what to think and what is going to happen. We resist. That's in our souls. That's our soul. We have our own independent thought. We're capable of it. We're not just molecules and all and matter. And of course, John, in what he writes, he's not into that sort of talk at all. Not that he specifically says so. John is clearly not going to go down the path of the universe as just being matter. 
He doesn't even contemplate such thoughts. Even though there were those in ancient Roman civilization who actually did believe that sort of thing. That group, the Epicureans, you read about them in Acts, they were at Mars Hill, thought that life revolved around pleasure and that gods, they don't matter if they even exist. But the, their motto was, I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. John has a different take because if we are matter, just matter, then ironically we as human life and human beings really don't matter. In f fact, nothing would matter. We're ultimately nothing. And as I said, does anybody really live like that? Try telling your husband or your wife that they're just a cells in a clump of molecules and see how they like it. John explains that we are indeed something more and indeed we do matter in the grand theme of things and there is a truth which we need to understand. In effect, John was unpacking what the truth actually is. It is popular today to say that you have your truth but I have my truth. But that makes no sense. It might seem charitable, respectful and conciliatory and to use the term of today, inclusive, but it's logically impossible. You can't have two truths. Either one is true and the other is false or whatever. If I have a clear understanding of what I believe to be true and that truth can be demonstrated, then all other truths, all claims to truth automatically declared invalid. They are not the truth. And by faith we either believe the truth that John expands in his word and is expanded throughout the scriptures, or we don't. John is declaring in his gospel the truth of what is going on in all of human existence and in all the universe and why Jesus was here on and came to the earth. Now John sets this all out and explains this when he says those words that I've already read twice. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It is interesting to note that G John uses a significant word when talking about the word in John chapter 1 verse 1. He uses the Greek word logos. You can think of in our English language we get a lot of words from that word logos. Anything L ending in L-O-G-Y comes originally from that Greek word. But I don't think John's thinking about that. I think he's got in mind part of the Old Testament. The Old Testament book of Proverbs speaks about wisdom and creative power that now comes to us in Jesus Christ, but which has existed for all time. I think that's what he's coming at. In Proverbs 3, 19 and 20, we read, The Lord by wisdom put in position the bases of the earth. By reason he put the heavens in their place. By knowledge the deep was parted and dew came dropping from the skies. That's the creative power. Now if we go on from verse 2 in John 1, this is what John says of the Logos. Through him all things were made and without him nothing was made that has been made. That is, through the Logos, through the Logos Everything that we can possibly know exists. He links the creative power directly to the man, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, the one who dwelt among them. Now that John has established the existence of the creative power, the wisdom or the logos, he goes on to tell us something <coughs> more about this logos who Christian theologians have rightly identified as Jesus. He says, 
In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The, dark, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's so beautiful, I think. This Jesus was not only the creative power at the beginning of the universe, but now he has come amongst us, says John. He was here with a purpose, and that purpose was to shine a light in the darkness of sin that confronts us and leads us, lead us out of that darkness. That was and is present in the world, still very much with us today. John has this to say in chapter 1, verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own received him not. But whatever that may be, the biblical idea of being enlightened is to talk about an enlightenment that comes by revelation from our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ. To talk about being enlightened reminds me of Matthew 4, 16, which is a quote from Isaiah 9, 2. I love this verse too. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, Naphtali the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light and those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Perhaps if we were saying that today we'd have to say from the river to the sea the people in darkness have seen a great light. If only they would. That was said of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to earth. That which was his own was the world and everything in it. It was the people that were his chosen people, God's people, the Jewish people. And they did not have a good record of following what Jesus was requesting of them. And so John goes on to say, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. That is to say, there were those, and John had seen them as, the, as he ministered and preached, and the other apostles did as well. The preaching of the gospel with the early church goes forth. They have seen many come to repentance and have turned to Jesus Christ for their salvation. This is at the time of John writing because he's writing probably later. But back to John as he spells out what's really going on. He goes on to say that the, the Logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Now, as the Gospel of John unfolds, as you go through it, we learn much more about this Logos who became flesh and dwelt among us. He presents himself to the disciples through them and through them to us, someone who can only be very God. You'll probably be aware that the Gospel of John, there are a lot of passages where the Apostle quotes Jesus when he uses the term I am. Those words, I am, are important to an understanding of God himself. There are several words that are used for God in the Old Testament. One of them is Yahweh. In the Hebrew language, and you'll learn this in Hebrew uh, class if you go to Bible college, one of them, the Hebrew language, it has the sense of I am what I am, and I will be what I will be, meaning that he is outside of all that we can possibly know. And for Jesus to use that term, I am, so regularly is to identify himself with the Heavenly Father. It was such a problem for the Jews at the time that someone would set himself up 
to be God. Now I think in ancient documents, we think about God as somebody who can perform miracles and do whatever he wants to do, you know, turn water into wine, walk on water. But I think the idea of God in ancient times was more that he made, made the rules, the one who made the rules. And that's why we see Satan saying to Adam and Eve, you can be as gods, basically saying you can make your own, own rules. And it, this idea that Jesus is saying that I really am God, I'm equivalent there, this really annoyed the Jews. They would have said, who is this guy that can presume to rewrite Moses? Oh, come on, they would have said, who do you think you are? But Jesus has an answer for them, and we read it in John 5, 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. In other words, you see, well, the Old Testament is a book in search of an answer. Even the Jews today will tell you that. And the religion of Judaism and the people who practice it in the local synagogue, they admit that. The religion of Judaism today is not the religion of the Old Testament. It is a development on. But it's an incorrect development. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and all that was written about in the Old Testament. And Jesus goes on to say all these things. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true vine. All this reinforces and expands on what John introduces us to back in chapter 1. It took a long time for the disciples who would become apostles to come to term with what Jesus was saying. They had so many crazy ideas going around in their mind about Israel because that is what the Jews sitting there in Jerusalem near the temple having their coffee outside the temple. Well, they didn't have coffee back then but mind you it was just down the road in Ethiopia. Not that anybody was drinking it. He, uh, they asked is it going to re-establish the kingdom? If it was going, is there going to be a, this, this was on their, this was their agenda. But Jesus, John records that the disciples were very slow to understand what Jesus was talking about. In John 14, we have the comments by the disciples and they're very instructive. First, Thomas says, we don't know where you're going and how will we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way the truth and the life. You follow me. And then Philip says, show us the Father. That's all we want. And Jesus, probably in frustration, although I'm sure very graciously, says to Philip, have I been so long with, we, me, with you and yet you do not know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And it seems that John, Jesus is saying to them, I know you have trouble understanding all this, but I'm going to send a comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will help, help you understand this. As John 14, 16 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Now the events of chapter 14 are followed up by Jesus arrested, and we know all about that. I won't go into them now. Christ is crucified, and the disciples are incredulous when they are told that he is actually still alive. Yes, risen from the dead. Thomas e doesn't even believe it. He wants proof. And their Lord, our Lord, graciously enough to give it to him. Even after all this, though, before the Lord ascends into heaven. The mind is still on the restoration of the earthly kingdom of Israel because if you read in Acts, that's what is being talked about. And Jesus says to them, probably in frustration, 
Look, don't worry about that. That's not for you to know. But just get on and do what you're supposed to do. It do. He says, the Holy Spirit is coming. He's going to come. He will lead you and lead you to the understanding of the truth and give you the power to go forward and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is what happens. And we still have it today. We still have the Holy Spirit to guide us as we study God's word and we hear God's word. The Holy Spirit ministers to us. And so we can come to the end of John's purpose in writing his gospel. He says that the world could not contain the whole books which could be written. And then he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in the book, this book. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God and that believing you might have life in his name. We have seen the glory, that's what he said, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And that is available to us now. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for your grace and truth and mercy toward us. We thank you that you are the light of this world. Help us, Heavenly Father, to take that on board and do what we need to do, Lord, as your followers in this place doing what you have allotted for us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.